Hello and welcome to episode 329 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Parrott and historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me as always is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Tech Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this brand new day, Bill? How are you? It seems like minutes since we last spoke, Seth. <laughs> odd. Weird. Very, very odd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with us again this week, and we're always glad to have him, is our good friend, historian John Parshall. How are you this brand new day in March? I I feel like I've been involved in some sort of a time warp experiment, but I too am just, yeah, I'm just peachy and delighted mm. to be back here again this next week. Yes, indeed. This happened, <laughs> this has happened now four weeks in a row. It kind of has. Mm. Yeah, well. <laughs> Maybe having somebody on the show means that we all talk too much, but yeah, here we are. So, <laughs> but if well, we're going to talk too much about any battle, this is the one to do it about. There you go. Indeed, indeed it is. And as we left you last week, we left you with the ultimate cliffhanger of Ernest Evans getting ready to charge into the teeth of the Japanese fleet right into Kurita's face. And that is exactly where we're going to pick up again this week. Bill, as Evans stands on the bridge of Johnston and surveys the scene, what does he see? What is going on right now? Yeah, sadly, he sees the outline of Japanese cruisers barreling down towards Taffy 3, which is not a good sign. I mean, the battleships would have hung back further, um, but those cruisers are going to look really ominous at this point, even before... Uh, Ziggy Sprague issues orders for the destroyers and the destroyer escorts to attack. Evans decides to do something on his own. Take the initiative. We said this before. Um, it was, you know, the old saying, you, you can do no wrong by closing with the enemy and yeah. engaging. And that's what he does. So just below the bridge on one of the 40 millimeter gun, gun mounts, these, no, the, the Bofors, I guess they are, 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. Bill Mercer watches as his destroyer drove away from the onrushing Japanese. It was then that he heard Evans' booming voice yell, left full rudder, as Mercer's Johnston heels over, oh no, to make a turn toward the Japanese at high speed. As Johnston's bow swung towards the cruisers, Mercer strapped on his life jacket because he can already start to see how this day's going to turn out, guys. Uh, you know, and I'm I'm laughing here, but I mean, talk about grim, grim humor. I mean, yeah. Well, there's nothing you really can do except strap on your life jacket, because the odds are mm -hmm. I'm going to be in it in the water in the not too distant future if I live. Yeah. Indeed. Now you don your battle your life jacket as soon as general quarters is sounded. Battle stations. But, you know, when you're at battle stations for hours, sometimes you stay on down a little bit. You relax it. Um, something told this guy if he did, he needed to put it back on. Yeah, yeah. and that, that is precisely what happens here. So Evans orders smoke and told OOD officer of the deck, Ed DeGardi, to zigzag as the smoke poured out from the smoke generator so as to lay a pattern for which the CVEs could hide. As Johnston came about, Johnston's gunnery officer, a guy named Bob Hagen, heard Evans's voice come over the ship's PA, quote, all hands to general quarters, prepare to attack major portion of the Japanese fleet, all engines ahead flank, commence making spoke, smoke and stand by for a torpedo attack, unquote. Again, pucker moment here yeah. for all aboard USS Johnston. So as Johnston turns and heads towards the enemy fleet, the Japanese immediately recognize the threat and start directing their fire towards her. Large caliber shells from the battleships as well as eight-inch shell fire from the cruisers start dropping all around Johnston as she charges. Hagen looks towards his captain. I mean, this guy had just balls of solid rock, man. Balls of solid rock. Looked towards his captain and saw Evan standing on the bridge, cool as a cucumber, hands on his hips, bellowing out orders as the Japanese shells flew towards his little destroyer. Absolutely, utterly fearless. Utterly fearless. Hagen's the gunnery officer, so he knows all about the range of these five-inch guns. He's keenly aware that they got to get close to start shooting and doing 
any kind of damage at all with these five inch guns on this Fletcher class destroyer inside those turrets. Every man aboard that ship knew exactly what was going on. They knew where they were going. They knew what was going down. All those guys in those turrets could do was sit there and wait out of range. All the gunners could, could do was listen for Hagen's voice to issue the orders and hang on at 0710. That waiting ends. Evans orders Hagen to direct his fire on the leading Japanese cruiser, which is Kumano, at 18,000 yards, which is the maximum range of these five inch guns. Yeah, I was going to say, you can't reach out any further with a five inch 38. No. That's a long way away. So, but you know, that's incredible because everything you see can outrange you. Yes. Everything. The cruisers, the you know, obviously the battleships, but but you've got to get inside. This is the, like the boxing match where the the dude with the short arms has to get outside, and you hope he and the, and he's got weak arms too in this case. Yeah, yeah. Thirty seconds later, the computer had the firing solution, and Hagen closes the firing key. Less than two seconds later, Johnson's five inches bark, her shells flying towards Kuma, which as Hagen watched through the binoculars, returned fire. Uh oh, an eight inch shell burst just off Johnston's bow through red dyed water. And this is a common practice. You know, the Japanese use dye in their shells. Like to, yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. for different ships. So you knew which of those bursts were yours. Correct. Exactly. And this is this is what's happening here. The red dye splashes all over the bridge of Johnston, covering Hagen in red dye. And he says, quote, I think they're mad at us, unquote. <laughs> So, so, and so Bill, right. yeah, indeed. So, Bill, tell us about uh, Johnston and and what's going on here from now on. Well, she's not a machine gun cruiser, so there's a limit to what she can do. But she kept her rapid fire that by now is beginning to find its mark. Hagen watched as the shells had be began hitting and exploding on Kumano's length. When he saw hits, he tightened the pattern to 100 yards. That's the error, accuracy error, the circular error of accuracy, and poured the fire into the Japanese cruiser through his binoculars. Hagen could see his shells hitting exposed gun positions and tearing chunks from Kumano's superstructure. That's almost the most you can hope for against an armored ship. Miraculously, Johnston, although she had been weaving through a force of shell splashes, had yet to be hit because Evans had been chasing the shell splashes, and so far, it had worked. As Johnston closed to within 10,000 yards of Kumano, Evans unleashed his torpedoes, all 10 of them. He had two quint mounts of two mounts of five torpedoes each. At 0727, at least one of Johnston's fish hit Kumano. Now this, a lot of torpedoes are gonna be fired by the Americans today. Not many of them are gonna hit, unfortunately, but this is one that does. The cruiser took the hit in her bow, and the resulting explosion tore her the bow off. How many American cruisers got their bows torn off by torpedoes in the early parts of this war? Now it happens to one of the Japanese cruisers, slowing the ship to 12 knots, forcing her to slew out of line. Japanese Admiral Shira Shirashi ordered Suzuya to come alongside and take he and his staff off in the middle of the fight. The Japanese cruiser force had been reduced by two for the time being. Anyway, John, you had something to say about this. Yeah, and, and two things I, I would impart here. Um, if you look at the, the Japanese records uh, in their track records of movement, they do not, in many cases, support the American visual claims of, oh, I hit this cruiser and I could see big chunks of the superstructure flying out and blah, 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 blah. There's there's overclaiming that's going to go on on both sides here. And so you have to take these American eyewitness accounts with a large grain of salt when it comes to what they think that they do to the enemy. Mm -hmm. On the flip, uh, this torpedo hit is absolutely documented, and it does exactly what uh, what they think it does. It, it tears Kumano's bow off. And, yes, yeah, she's now effectively out of the fight. Uh, and she's going to have a a pretty miserable coming month. She ends up limping back through uh, Cebuian Sea, makes it back to Manila. They slap a, a, a you know, placeholder bow on her such that she can now continue to limp home. And during this time, she comes under air attack and yada, yada, yada. She's eventually going to be sunk off the, the west coast of, of Luzon. And 
Halsey famously said, if there's one Japanese ship I, I could almost feel sorry for, it was Kumano because of her ordeal that is going to ultimately end up in her demise. So she's out at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's kind of odd, too. We didn't address this yet, but we should. Shirashi uh, orders Suzuya to come and take his staff in the middle of the fight. You now That's crazy. You mm -hmm. lose one cruiser, which is yours, obviously, without the bow. Now you just took a second one out. Right. To do that. I, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, the 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 intermediary solution to that is you call a tin can over sure. and, mm -hmm. you know, I'll move my flag temporarily to a tin can that's got the speed to overhaul a cruiser if need be. But yeah, I don't want to be taking a second, a second of my heavy units out. Cause now, you know, the net result is I came in with six heavy cruisers. I'm now down a third of that force uh, just because I have to transfer my flag. Yeah. Which takes time. It's not like he's going to jump in, you know, it's not a yeah. five minute ordeal here either. No. So as soon as Johnson's torpedoes are away, Evans orders Johnson to come about and just book it, just get out of there. As she did so, however, at 0730, the little destroyer absolutely walked into a walked into three 18.1 inch shells from a Yamato. One is at least one of the shells penetrated through and through and did not explode, although the damage they did was severe. Johnston's aft machinery room, machinery room was destroyed reducing her speed from 25 to 17 knots. The massive shells blew through the ship and erupted a boiler in the after-fire room. Superheated steam scalded everybody in there to death. All of her five-inch guns were knocked out temporarily, yet as she passed through a rain squall, they gave her about a 10-minute breath of air. Some of those guns, three of them to be exact, come back online. Hagen wrote... Or, or said in an interview one time that getting hit by those 18 inch shells was like a puppy getting hit by a truck. I remember that exact quote. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> again, you think so, about a 3,200 pound shell coming down at 2000 feet per second. I mean, that is a hell of a lot of kinetic energy. Big time. Two comments. The interesting point is that of course there's not enough armor on a destroyer to cause that shell to detonate. Hence it, penetrates right goes right through it and the second thing is spoiler alert uh when they found the ship right uh, petrol found the ship you could see this hole oh, yeah. in the uh, underwater footage can't you oh yeah oh yeah it, it's a big one too it, it is it is a big mm -hmm. one it's 18.1 inches room but yeah the funniest thing so seconds after Yamato's main battery finds its mark, her secondary secondary battery scores on Johnston as well. At least it's assumed it's her secondary battery. Shells hit the hit the destroyer on her forward funnel and port side of her bridge. Bob Hagen, the gunnery officer, who had been knocked down by the shells, stood up and looked outside his gun director and sees Ernest Evans now bare-chested, with singed hair, his face blackened, and bleeding. His left hand was pouring blood and he was missing two fingers. He staggers to his feet and begins bellowing orders again, refusing medical attention from the ship's doctor, saying, don't bother me now. If Just, not now, when? Um, yeah, really. yeah no, so so a couple of points. Now, now did, the, did the blast blast his shirt off? Clothes off, yeah. More mm -hmm. likely, you know, it, it's, it gets seared and scorched by the, the, uh, the flash burns. Right. And then you, you want to rip it off because it's so hot. But, you know, it's one of those things happen. It's just amazing that he's still standing there fingerless yeah. and, and barking out orders. And, ha and has the, the mental wherewithal to start barking out orders. That's even more impressive right. to me is that yeah. not only can he physically stand there, which is a feat in and of itself, he mm -hmm. can process things and get orders out and act like he's supposed to act, which is unbelievable. Bill... Johnston is not the only one that makes an attack here, though, are they? No, no, no. You've got the, you know, other ships alongside there, the USS Hole, spelled like Noel with an H, right? So we'll pronounce it Hole and Hearman. They came about and selected targets at 0737. Hole selected the solitary Congo as her target. Congo had gone off on her own from the rest of the battleships and was roughly where Kumano had been before she was hit. So, John, what the heck is this guy 
You know, is this like a melee, like in a civil war skirmish where everybody is running off on their own? What's That's, going on? What yeah. Ship break formation. Uh, you, you've essentially summed it up. And actually, I went back into her troms and was trying to there's no mention of that in her troms at all. And, and actually, if you look at the Japanese accounts, they, too, are pretty silent uh, on this particular matter. But when Kurita, you know, cites the enemy force, one of the one of the first things he does is orders uh, general attack, which is essentially saying Still. charge. Um, mm -hmm. everybody everybody go for it on their own and the result is that the japanese formation is not a formation it is just a group of warships that are independently closing whatever targets they feel are appropriate one of the things that um, ugaki on yamato complains about numerous times in his diary is that because it, it was such a surprise for them to come across our force they were he says that we were very late in reacting and very slow to react. And so, uh, he's, you know, each unit seemed very slow in starting actions due to uncertainty about enemy conditions. Later on, he says uh, the fleet's attacking directions were also conflicting. And I feared the spirit of all out attack at short range was lacking. Um, later on, he invades against uh, invades against the Seventh Heavy Cruiser Division. Start was extremely slow. So, part of this is driven by the fact that Ugaki is a jerk. Um, you know, Seth and I were kind of talking about this uh, yes. beforehand. That this is a guy who never lets an opportunity to poke somebody else in the eye pass him by. Um, so. But you do get a sense from the Japanese side that they're that we don't have a coherent plan of what we're going to do here. It really is just everybody doing their own thing. And as a result, apparently uh, Congo is slightly out of the main formation, is kind of off doing her own thing here, uh, leaving her exposed to attack by these two other destroyers. Yeah, Ugaki throughout his diary, like you said, he never misses an opportunity to, to to point the finger at somebody else and yet never accepts blame for anything that goes wrong on his end. So yeah, he's he's a bit of a wiener. A bit of a wiener. So so Hull, USS Hull, launched torpedoes that Congo apparently evades. Um, but as Hull approaches closer, both Congo and Hogoro absolutely pound the destroyer with shell fire. Uh, Hull loses one of her engines, three of her guns, her fire control director, and her bridge steering and her radar all go out. Boom. I mean, this thing, again, when you're taking a Fletcher class destroyer, any destroyer, and you're attacking a battleship and a heavy cruiser to where those battleships and heavy cruisers, unlike the barroom brawl Friday the 13th, can get their main batteries In to action. hit you, things are, think bad things are going to happen to your ship. And that's exactly what happens here. At 0742, Sprague issues an order for another torpedo attack. Upon receiving those or these orders, Hull again charges in, closing to within 6,000 yards, and fires her what remained of her five uh, torpedoes at 0750. So, I mean, you, you can see this, this happens quickly. This is an eight-minute process here. It appeared that the torpedoes hit the target, which was Hoguro. As Americans claim, they saw geysers of water, but those apparently were shell splashes or, as we said last week, bombs because the Japanese were under consistent air attack, and this is exactly one of those times. So, no, her torpedoes do not hit Hoguro. But it is more than likely shell splashes or bombs, more than likely bombs. They're being dropped by Taffy 2's aircraft at this time. Yeah. So, you know, under normal circumstances, you would castigate an admiral like Sprague, you know, you know, ordering another torpedo attack. That's easy for you to say. You're not the guy that's got to drive in within 7,000 yards to deliver this thing. But on the other hand, Ziggy is under shell fire himself. I mean, it's not yes. like he's immune from any of this. Right. He's he's ordering the escorts to do what escorts are supposed to do. So Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, were talking about the the mighty aircraft here which is accurate and 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 as John said last week the advantage I'm going to put that word in quotes uh, <laughs> of the, of our air assault this time is the aircraft are divided among many aircraft carriers the CVEs rather yeah. than just four you know and so that be, that means that it's easier it, it might be it, these CVEs may be more vulnerable 
But if you take one out, it's taking out a smaller, by far smaller percentage of your deck space for aircraft. And so that means that you're able to keep up this, this, this rate of air sortie generation, which yep. is really going to turn the tide of this battle. And so and it, that's, and it happens all but, day. But they aren't running all late. day. Good, Seth. No, I was going to say it happens all day. What you what you were describing goes Correct. on all friggin' day. And but the thing you got to keep in mind is these CVEs are slow, and they're inside gunfire range, yeah. and they're being shot at. So yeah, yeah Ziggy Greg says, you know, do some of that destroyer <laughs> stuff. <laughs> exactly. Put some. Just put some space between me and the ships that are shooting at my aircraft carriers. All right. I got. Yeah. The, the thing that's really going to turn the tide of this battle. As much as we hate to say that, it's the truth. Yeah. Well, it is the truth. It is the truth. So crippled due to the shell fire that she receives and reduced to 17 knots, USS Hull is in serious trouble. Her captain, Captain Clint Berger, crew they got their steering restored and the ship began to draw away albeit slower than she had been before firing at the japanese ships as she withdrew hull had battleships on her starboard quarter and cruisers on her port she was fairly well surrounded and she was out of options surrounded and Market slowing down oh gosh you're not kidding Hole was easier to hit, obviously, as she's slowing down. Shells are tearing into her, flooding her compartments. She begins to list the port quickly, and Clint Berger ordered abandoned ship, even as her forward turrets continued to fire. With her stern awash, messengers had to go into the forward turrets, because comms are pretty much gone, and tell the gunners to get out of the damn turrets, because they were still rocking and rolling. At yeah. 0855, Hole rolls to port and goes down stern first. Only 86 of her crew survives. 253 men went, men went down with the ship or died awaiting rescue. Of his men, Clint Berger later said, quote, fully cognizant of the inevitable result of engaging such vastly superior forces, these men performed their assigned duties coolly and efficiently until their ship was shot from under them, unquote. You know, again, we, we said last week, and we're going to say it again, yeah. Bravery dial at 11. At 11, at 11 <laughs> every time. And it's not mm -hmm. just Johnston. Everybody focuses on Johnston and later Sammy B, and we'll talk about her too. But it was all of them. All it of really them. was. It was all of them. Yeah. Bill, tell us about Hearman. Yeah, before we get to Sammy B, we've got the Hearman, which, who raced through the slow CVE formation to form up with the whole and the small destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts, Sammy B, for the torpedo attack. Hearman closed in astern of Hull, and at 0754, she fired her torpedoes at Hagaro from roughly 9,000 yards. But these two missed the mark. Pulling away, Hearman spotted the battleships Yamato, Megado, yes. and Harana off her port bow. That could not have been a pleasant sight. Closing wow. to within 4,400 yards, she fired her remaining five torpedoes but again, missed guys. I'm struck by the fact too that you don't you don't hear practically anything about Japanese torpedo fire throughout this engagement. Yeah. You know, and I I haven't gone back and dug through the records, and you know, you you really should add a Tony Tolly on here and some you know a slacker like me. But uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the the long lance plays practically zero. Uh, role in the in this entire engagement i'm not and i'm not sure why that is to be honest with you i don't know because i mean what was the range on those things i mean it was exorbitant lord above yeah it depends on the speed setting but um at a high speed setting and this is just off the top of my head i think it's around twenty six thousand yards yeah at 52 yeah, knots remember down in the solomons when one got a hit at something like eighteen thousand yards yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty-three. Yeah, it was some yeah. egregious yeah. range. Yeah, I think that was against the blue, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, L ludicrous oh, range. Yeah, yeah either crazy. either way. Yeah, long. It, day. It, they were designed to have the range of a battleship gun mm -hmm. because they were designed to be able to reach out and touch enemy battleships at that range. And but yeah, there's all of the destruction that's being meted out to the American surface escorts here is is happening because of gunfire. We don't hear. Mm -hmm any you know reports of torpedo hits against any of these escorts because we sure would have known about it if they'd gotten it 
and even even if they're not going to shoot their long lances at the destroyers and the destroyer escorts, which one would assume that they're not going to yeah you're within range of those cves absolutely and you and still don't they, fire and they ain't know moving of. yeah no. i mean to an extent torpedo fire in in world war ii really is an exercise and fire and forget just saturate the the target area if i send enough fish swimming down that general vector and you know i've something got it. yeah i'm gonna hit something so but they yeah. didn't yeah don't know so anyway. Hearman Hearman now engages Harana in a gun duel, which is not a healthy thing to do. Yeah. Uh, for eight minutes, the little destroyer uh, trades fire with the 14-inch gun battleship, zigging and zagging, chasing shell splashes, which is a proven thing. Hearman was amazingly not hit yet. Her time would come later when she engages the cruisers that we were just talking about, trying to defend her CVEs. She's pummeled by gunfire yet she would be the only destroyer from the screen to survive the fight would be the uss hearman so another one of the legendary ships in this event is of course destroyer escort uss samuel b roberts she is these not just her but the destroyer escorts are the smallest ships in the american counterattack. uh none of which by the way were ordered to take part in this counterattack. yet all of them, on their own volition, decided to take part in this counterattack. And John, these are not fast ships. No, they're not. Um, these are not just small destroyers. I mean, some people have that sort of mental image. These are purpose-built anti-submarine warfare vessels. That's what they're built for. Um, we had realized by you know during the Battle of the Atlantic that actually a destroyer in the Atlantic was it was a pretty crummy anti-submarine warfare platform. They're they're too big, they're fuel hogs. Um, what you needed was a ship that was a little bit smaller, but a good sea boat um, in order, you know, to to hunt down submarines. And so something in the 300, 320 foot length range, 20 some knots, and armed with a couple five inch guns and a bunch of automatics, that's plenty uh, to take on a submarine. And so that's what these ships are. And obviously, they are in no way fit to go up against any any of the Japanese combatants that are in this fight, because um, their surface gunnery is is nothing to write home about. But again, um, uh, bravery to dialed up to eleven. They're like, well, we're part of the escort force too. We got to do our thing, and that's exactly what they do. Indeed, USS Raymond, yeah. USS Dennis, John C. Butler, and Samuel B. Roberts join in on the attack. Go ahead, Bill. What I was going to add to that, John, is people think that uh, modern iteration of the destroyer escort is a frigate. It's not. The important word in DE is escort. These ships mm -hmm. were designed to escort. They're 100% ASW frigates or not frigates today in modern times are basically midget destroyers that mm -hmm. do kind of the same thing, only not as well. And that's right. not what the DE did. So Sammy B is under the command of a gentleman named Commander Robert Copeland. Uh, against orders, Copeland decides that he should attack, much like Ernest Evans. Copeland told his crew, quote, this will be a fight against overwhelming odds from which survival cannot be expected. We will do what damage we can, unquote. Doing her best speed under the smoke of the faster destroyers, so she's falling in behind the destroyers. And, and quickly getting left in their wake. <laughs> big time, mm -hmm. big time. Roberts stays hidden because she's hiding in the in the Japanese smoke, in the American smoke, as she's getting closer to it. Not wanting to give away his position, Copeland denies his gunner's permission to fire, instead driving to within 4,000 yards of the cruiser Chokai. Firing all of her torpedoes, Roberts initially believed they had hit Chokai, but again, as we've seen before, in reality, they did not. Again, I don't know if they see, there's nothing that says they see splashes or anything. One assumes that they must. But again, the Japanese are under aerial assault at this very same time. So who knows? But Seth, that's got to, we got to go back to that speech because that's got to be one of the most epic speeches the entire war. Oh, yeah. Survival cannot be expected. I mean, I want to underscore that. Stomp my foot on that speech. Oh, boy, that's going to motivate your crew. Um, <laughs> in any case, it, you know, it works, and we're going to talk about how this resolves in a moment. Yeah. 
At 0810, Commander Copeland realized there was no need for camouflage any longer as his ship had been seen as she came out of the smoke following her torpedo attack. She opens fire with her five-inch battery. She trades shots with both Chokai and Chikuma, supposedly hitting Chokai repeatedly in her superstructure with five-inch shell fire. John, is there any confirmation of that? You had to put me on the spot like that, didn't you, man? <laughs> you had to. Um, yeah. I can do, do real time history stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't remember. Watch, huh? Yeah. I can admit I could, that. I I'm big enough to admit yeah. that. You know. Yeah. So while you're while you're digging, while you're digging, digging, Bill, tell us about what else is going on here with Copeland. What what does he do with Roberts? <clears throat> well, he brings he brings Robert in at high speed and pumps rounds into the two cruisers, trading shots between the two targets, which is not easy. Now he's got. He's got two guns, right? So you could put one on each, but, but it's going to be kind of like that. For the next 35 minutes, the little destroyer escort, escort nearly shot every round she had. Over 600 rounds of five-inch shells in 35 minutes. As Copeland attempts to bring Sammy B out of the area, she came under fire from no less than five Japanese ships. So you've got the smallest ship in this battle being taken on by five Japanese ships, including Yamato and Nagato. <laughs> so desperate to avoid the shells, Copeland orders his engines all back to cause the incoming rounds to miss. Now, guys, this, this is not a good, good tactic. I'm sorry. Backing away from shells, not a good tactic. However, the chart change in speed did actually make him an easier target. Is when you go all back, you don't stop immediately. It just slows you down, which is not a good way to get away from anything, whether it's submarines or shell fires, Seth. Yeah. No. The answer is <laughs> no. What was the question? <laughs> whether, or not, whether or not Sammy B hits her, and it, it would appear that the answer is no, although she does later on take some shell hits, and this may be the same ones that they're observing. And it looks as if she was actually hit by five-inch gunfire from the CVE White Plains. So wow. there's an eye opener. Anyway. How about that? Good. All right. Well, I want to emphasize something you just said, Bill, about this gunfire duel. 35 minutes. 35 minutes. This destroyer escort is trading shots with two Japanese cruisers. And then later comes under fire from two Japanese battleships, including Yamato. 35 minutes. That is an eternity. That is an yeah, absolute is. eternity in yeah. naval warfare. At 0851, Roberts is hit by the first of several eight-inch shells, which cause damage to one of her boilers, slows her down to 17 knots. This is after Copeland puts on the brakes here. Uh, she begins to take a pounding from the cruisers, went at 0900. Congo, at least it's assumed it's Congo, found her with a 14-inch salvo that killed her one remaining engine and caused her to flood rapidly. No surprise here. Her main steam line broken by the shell. Roberts was dying a horrible death with men scalding to death in the forward fire room. As Roberts begins to sink, Copeland gave the order to abandon ship. As he did so, out of the smoke ahead of him loomed the shattered USS Johnston, trailing after the second torpedo attack, a wreck Still in the fight. God, this guy's badass. Bill, mm -hmm. tell us about the death of Johnston here. <clears throat> when the destroyer ran out of ran in for the torpedo attack, the retreating Johnston came about and joined the charge again. Out of torpedoes, Johnston could provide gunfire support as the others charged in. Johnston closed to within six thousand yards of Tone and open fire again. Johnston, her steering wreck, had to be controlled and steered from aft steering. This is emergency steering in the back. Mm -hmm. Evans grew tired yelling through the voice tube, <laughs> rudder orders to aft steering from the bridge that's basically useless anyway because it's been destroyed. Yeah. So he goes stern to the fantail, opens a hatch, and he screams his helm orders through the hatch to the sailors controlling the rudder locally. You you can't make this stuff up, guys. This is incredible. This yeah. is absolutely, you know, you if you told me, if you wrote this in a novel, 
I'd say, yeah, there's right. no way these yeah. guys are making this stuff. This is this is not realistic, but it happened. Yeah, it's, I mean, total bam. Yeah, I mean, it's mm. incredible. It really is. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. Her radar is knocked out, obviously. Her guns were in local control, which means they could be fired individually by the guys inside those guns, inside the turrets. And they fired at what they could... Go ahead. With lousier accuracy as a result. I mean, when you lose your director control, your your accuracy just completely goes out the window. But that's what you got to do. It's what you got to do. So... With their own eyes, they had to spot the shells. Each individual turret had to spot the shells... From 7,000 yards at 0820, she begins to get in a gun duel with Harana again. Uh, this is a second destroyer trading shots with this battleship. Um, she claims she sees hits. God knows. I know, I'm know. i assuming, John, you're looking it up right now. But uh, <laughs> regardless of this, trading shots with the battleship, Johnston was not hit at this time and retreated into her own smokescreen. Ten minutes later, she emerges from the smoke to see Gambier Bay, USS Gambier Bay, under intense shell fire from a cruiser, assumed, assumedly Chikuma. Seeing this, Evans told Bob Hagen, the, uh, Johnston's gunnery officer, quote, Hagen, commence firing on that cruiser, draw her fire on us and away from that carrier, unquote. Again, just bravery of the utmost we're already shot to hell. We look like Swiss cheese. I've been hit. I don't even have any freaking clothes on, by the way. And I want you to draw fire onto us to save that carrier. I don't have any freaking clothes on. I mean, yeah. I mean, God almighty, the yeah, bravery there's, there's of this guy. not a lot of evidence uh, here that, that she took uh, shell hits from the surface ship. She does come on... You know, come under air attack as well um, yeah. during this exact same time. But anyway... And no. that, and you know, and but that's that's important to note, though. Again, we've we've hit on this, and we're going to hit on it again. That the air attacks are going on as all this is going on. So yeah. the gunnery phase and this aerial assault is all happening at the same time. One gigantic furball. Yeah, and there might be a few mm-hmm. minutes where there where one is not doing you know at the same time. But yeah. regardless, most of this is happening at the same time. And you can imagine, again, you said you got to take the credit or the claims with a grain of salt, and you do, but. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot and, of things going on. And honestly, this is how ha- making a difference. The air attack would be very different if these surface engagements weren't drawing attention away right. from the from the guys on the bridges of those ships who yeah. are afraid those destroyers five inch shells are going to kill them. Right. That has a way of distracting you. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking about the length of the, the engagement, you know, 35 mm-hmm. minutes spent, you know, shooting at other ships. That's 35 minutes when those Japanese ships weren't shooting at the escort carriers. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. So, right. Yeah, no, they're, they're, doing, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're yeah. drawing attention yep. away from the CVEs. So now trading shots with no less than four different Japanese ships, including destroyers, who, by the way, are now making their first appearance into this fight, Japanese destroyers. Yeah. Johnston became engulfed in the enemy shell fire. She takes hit after hit, but she continues to hit, to deliver her fire, albeit sporadically. From as close as 6,500 yards, Hagen fired and scored supposedly a dozen hits on the destroyer leader before it veered off, shifted fire to the next destroyer in line, and amazingly, the entire squadron turned west to avoid Johnston's fire, again, supposedly. Mixed in a jumble, and this is true, the Japanese ships began to pour fire into Johnston, who began to slowly die. Her gun mounts became knocked out one by one. Her hull was holed and at zero many times, and at 0940, her last engine was knocked out, leaving the gallant ship dead in the water. Perhaps vengeful, and this is in record, the Japanese concentrated fire on Johnston for a long time leaving the CVEs alone for a brief respite. At 0945, Evans orders abandoned ship. 25 minutes later, Johnston sinks with 186 of her crew with her. Evans was last seen on her stern and reportedly, and there's several different accounts, so nobody knows. Reportedly, he went into the water but was never seen again. So we don't know if he went down with the ship or if he got in the water. There's several guys that say he was in a boat and then was never seen again. Regardless of this, 
one of the bravest human beings to ever put on the United States naval uniform, is awarded the Medal of Honor for these actions, and rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully Absolutely. so. Absolutely. Yep. So. Whew. That's pretty much the end of the escort force at this point. It is. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah. It really is. The I mean, think about it, though. I mean, so this is this is three hours now, a little more than three hours after the initial detection of this Japanese force. It's now 0945 when these ships go down. They join the action around, what, 0730 Seven. or so. So they've yeah, been in combat for you know, more than two hours at this point. It's taken the Japanese that long to dispatch a force of seven destroyers and, and destroyer escorts. It's that's a, a weighty contribution on their part, for sure. In, indeed, indeed. And, and and to be clear, we're not diminishing their contribution at all. We're just trying to set yeah. the record straight that there was a lot of things going on at a the lot same of things time. Going it, on. Wasn't, it wasn't the yep. DEs and DDs that turned Corita around. Bill, yep. the gunfire isn't directed just at the American screening force, is it? No, it's certainly not, because as we said before, the CVEs are within gunfire range. They're, you know, they're trying to go as fast as they can, but they can't go very fast to get away from these, you know, this line, um, fleet line that's chasing them. The entire time, the Japanese were forced to fend off the attacks of the destroyers and the destroyer escorts. They continued their focus on the slow CVEs. As far as Korea knew, the carriers he was attacking were fleet carriers. The fact that they couldn't get away very fast should have been a hint to him that they weren't fleet carriers, that they were slow carrier escorts. But for some reason, we'll never know. You know, he he, he doesn't get this right. It doesn't matter. He's going to go after them anyway, whether he thinks they're fleet carriers or not. As such, they were his primary focus, and the screening attacks were like incense, incessant flies at a picnic. Initial gunfire on the CVEs from the, from the Japanese battleships uh, they came from the Japanese battleships, and as the range to the targets closed, the Japanese cruisers lit into the slow carriers as well. The bombardment from Japanese surface ships lasted a little over two hours and was slightly effective at best. Japanese gunnery had been somewhat accurate, but as TAF E3 went in and out of rain squalls, remember, with continuous American aircraft attacks against them the entire time. They hid behind their smoke screens. The shooting became wilder and wilder until the rain closed. Even when the CVEs were wide open targets, the Japanese ships were under constant aerial harassment. And so the Japanese gunfire was enough to do some damage, but was largely ineffective, Seth. Yeah. So, John, we, we kind of touched on this briefly, but they have radar, but they're they're having to visually sight these yeah. targets and they have to visually shoot at these targets. They're not That's this isn't Willis Lee's battle line here. No, so, no. The the Japanese never had the the capability to do what we would call a blind shoot, uh relying on radar solely to to do in these targets. It's it's always going to be some sort of a hybrid solution that'll have a radar component for ranging and then an optical component for for deflection. Mm -hmm. and, Right. So, yeah, you've got you've got a number of hindrances then to Japanese gunnery. There are these rain squalls that they keep ducking into. There are there's a lot of smoke being laid um, frantically by the American ships to try to hide these carriers. And of course, because of these aerial attacks, I am slewing out of line. In many cases, I'm doing evasive maneuvers that throws my fire solution out the window. Once I settle down again on a new base course, okay, it's going to take me a few minutes to reacquire that solution, regenerate it, start shooting again. Um, but yeah, their 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 gunnery. The longer this action goes on, the worse their gunnery is getting. Yeah, initial salvos from the battleships shooting at the CVEs was as di from distance as as far as thirty six thousand yards which is absurd. Yeah, I forget what the longest recorded uh, battleship hit was. It, for many years, they said it was war spite against an Italian ship at Calabria. And I think it was like, was, I, I want to say 24,000 plus yards or something like that. Um, yeah, so 36,000 yards, that's that's like you're shooting from the moon. 
Um, but it's you know, you, Mary, you, it yeah, it really yeah. is. But you know, Yamato's got the guns to to do that kind of nonsense, and so why wouldn't you? I don't know. Anyway, the cruisers are the ones that are really going to do some of the damage, some of the main damage here to the CVEs. They pour on the coal to gain ground on these on these almost a destroyer escorts on these escort carriers. Uh, their superior speed, despite the air and screening attacks, proved to be a bit of a game changer here in a minute. Um, in their coordinated attack, the cruisers worked around the port beam of the CVEs to approach them from short range as the CVEs could not maneuver fast enough to get out of the way. As Sprague brought Taffy 3 to the southwest, Kalinan Bay was in the rear of the formation. Now, you got to remember, these guys are swerving, they're getting, they're moving all over the place, so carriers are going to trade places in the rear of the formation as the formation turns at this particular time kalinan bay is tail in charlie uh, at 0750 she receives the first of her shell hits probably from a battleship it is assumed that went clean through her hangar deck and out the other side over 13 other shell hits pounded kalinan bay with at least 12 of them being eight inch cruiser shots what was key for Kalinan Bay and the other CVEs, for that matter, was the fact that they were, as we said last week, essentially unarmored. And as such, the AP shells went boop, right yeah. through them and did not arm and explode internally, which had they been shooting against an Essex class? Yeah, might have been a different story. Completely um, there's, different there's, story. There's a convincing argument here to be made that the Japanese, if they were going to take these CVEs under fire, should have been using HE rather than AP. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> so, yeah, agreed. So the shells that did cause, that did hit, did cause damage, uh, caused flooding, fires, and hold, and, and hold the hull in Kalinan Bay and gave her a list to starboard. Ironically enough, and this is in her damage control, the list to starboard allowed the DC parties the chance to plug the holes on the port side that were left when the shells went through. Wow. American ingenuity, baby. That's yeah, all I can American, say. American damage control again. Yay. Yay team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill, tell us about Fanny Bay, Fanshawe Bay. Yeah, so Fanshawe Bay took four cruiser hits, all forward, that killed personnel and left light damage. White planes took damage, albeit light damage, considering she was among the first targets of the fight. Interesting to note that white planes fought back, not only with her aircraft, but also with her five-inch guns. She fired 127 rounds of five-inch ammunition during the battle. Gambier Bay, however, did not fare as well as her sisters. As the battle dragged on, she became the last sheep in the column. Now she's tail end, Charlie. As at the rear of the formation, she was not covered by smoke, and the cruisers worked their way closer. She came under increasing shell fire, and at 0741, Gambier Bay fought back with her single five-inch gun, and her captain chased salvos to escape for the time being. This went on for about 30 minutes until she took her first hit in the after portion of her flight deck. A fire started, which seemed to attract the wolves even more. At 0820, she received a punishing hit from one of the battleships that exploded underwater. Not the battleship exploded under The hit exploded underwater. Her hull ruptured and flooded her forward engine room. So this is the beginning of the end for her, Seth. Yeah. Yeah. There, her there's some just I was just gonna say there's some harrowing pictures, of course, from this action where you can, mm -hmm. you know, see these American CVEs trying to pour on the coal and on the horizon you can see yeah. Japanese ships, you know, shooting at them. It's uh yeah, it's pretty scary stuff. There's a picture and I think without looking at it right now, I believe there's a photograph. It's a, I think it's a white plains. And and it's taken from I want to say Gambier Bay or maybe it's the other way around. Regardless, they got aircraft on the deck. They're trying to launch, and you could see shell splashes yeah. sprouting around this carrier as she's trying to conduct flight operations. It's yeah, it's a hairy day. Let's just yeah. say it's a day at the office. By the way, if you're that pilot, you're happy to be launched. I yeah. bet you, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to yeah. stick around, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, really get me the hell <laughs> off of this thing. Yeah. So Gambier Bay's speed falls to 11 knots. Obviously, she's going to fall behind the rest of the formation. She's easy prey. Soon after the first major caliber shell hit uh, that she receives, she receives another and starts listing to port. Over the next half hour, she, she receives at least 26 hits 
ranging from 18.1 inch, 14 inch, and 8 inches. So she's just getting hammered. At 0845, she goes dead in the water. Abandoned ship is ordered. She capsizes at 0907. The only one, which is amazing, of the CVEs to be sunk by enemy gunfire. Keyword, enemy gunfire. All right, so after Gambier Bay capsizes, rolls over, and sinks, and she is the only CVE to do this, which is unbelievable. Crazy. She's the only one to be sunk by gunfire. We have to, and we talked about it last week. We went into it for 45 minutes or so about Halsey's decision. We got to revisit it because he's still around. Bill Halsey is still around at this time. While the battle is raging, and I do mean raging, off of Samar, Admiral Kincaid sends a flurry of messages asking Halsey and really anyone who's listening, where the hell is Task Force 34 and Admiral Lee? Bill, what's going on? Yeah, so Seth, last week I said that there's something going on in Halsey's head. There's a behavioral issue here that um, I don't remember anybody really analyzing, doing this. And I'm not, don't know, it's, I'm not going to say it's psychological, it might be medical, because here we go. Word, he gets the word through various means that a lot of his people are being killed. And what we're going to talk about here in a moment is that he rages. Not because people are being killed, that may be his fault, but because he feels like he might have been insulted. There's something wrong with that, okay? And I can't pound my foot on that point too hard. Not worried about the people being killed, worried about the fact that maybe Admiral Nimitz insulted me. So here we go. While the battle rages off Samar and Admiral Kincaid, Admiral Kincaid sends a flurry of messages asking where the hell was Task Force 34 and Admiral Lee. You remember, Halsey sent a message out, we, which I, we call a warning order, which says, I may assemble this Task Force 34 battleships and, and you know, be aware that I may, may do that. And then he let it drop. He never said, what, do it, assemble the battle force, the Task Force 34. He never said when he was going to do it, what would trigger it. He just let it drop. Didn't say anything. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> right. So Halsey didn't learn of the battle until 0822 that morning. Initially, Halsey said that he was not alarmed, thinking that Oldendorf and his dreadnoughts would be there to fend off the Japanese, defend the Japanese off. As we know, that wasn't the case. And he didn't know the disposition of his forces. At any rate, according to his subordinates, when Halsey received the message, he looked suddenly very concerned, probably realizing he'd screwed up. He also realized that his and his aviator's conclusion as to the battle readiness of the center force was way off the mark. And I would say, I'm not going to put this at the feet of his aviators. I'm going to say that he was way off the mark. Eight minutes after the first message came, the next message from Kincaid, Kin Kincaid came asking bluntly where the fast battleships were. Of course, they were with Halsey. Hell, he was on one of them, on New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Halsey, later, Halsey later claimed to be surprised by Kincaid's suggestion of Lee's battleships contesting Santa Bernardino. In, in response, Halsey orders McCain's task group 38.1, who was just coming back from Ulifty and were 400 miles away to make their best speed into the area. Again, he doesn't know the disposition of his forces. This my friends, is malfeasance of the highest order. Yeah, he, he's, he's got target fixation is what it is, in, in my opinion. He's got target fixa fixation on Ozawa's toothless carriers, and he's just yeah. not there right now, literally, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. He's not there right now. So this is key here. Most of Kincaid's messages were sent in the clear which means that Nimitz and King were reading them. <laughs> King, King, no surprise here, uh, was apparently livid as the situation developed. And later, and this is not- How can you tell? Well, it's Admiral King. How can you tell he was livid? <laughs> How can you tell? Exactly, because Jocko Clark <laughs> was in the room. Seriously, Jocko oh, Clark mm -hmm. is in the room. He's in D.C. at this time, and he's like watching King pace the no. inside of his office and just- as Jocko Clark said, the language was very blue, which means, of course, probably <laughs> yeah. every other word out of that man's mouth has got four yeah. letters in it. 
So yep. apparently King later, after all this goes down, seriously considered relieving Admiral Halsey, like mm-hmm. pulling him out and saying, that's it, your ass is done. Should have happened. We Come can on. talk about that later, yeah. Nimitz <laughs> too was on pins and needles apparently throughout the entire ordeal, constantly buzzing his assistant chief of staff for updates on the battle. And to your point, John, which you put in the notes, he had never done that before, ever. No. Nimitz had. Nimitz was not a control freak. Uh, Nimitz was capable of delegating and trusted his subordinates. And so the fact that he is, yeah, absolutely pacing up and down and, and wondering what the heck is going on, um, that's very unlike him. This is a guy who is able to keep his cool in pretty much any situation, and he is not cool right now. He is not. And apparently he gets so hot and bothered. Nimitz does. He gets so hot and bothered that he actually leaves his headquarters and goes back to the house and starts pitching horseshoes because he's like, I got to yep. get out of here. I got to get <laughs> out of here. I got to do something to take my mind off of this show right. that's going down here. I need to just go. So yep. he goes because <laughs> there's nothing he can really do. He yeah. he he's I mean, he can give orders, but he can't control it. So <clears throat> by the way, that's yeah, I've walked that walk from uh, from Makalapa headquarters to his house a bunch of times. It's only 50 feet. So this isn't a long walk. It's like like he's abandoning his station. Is but he still, in Guam yet? Mm, oh, no, at Guam, this point, he's in Pearl. No? He's in Pearl right now for my, at least I think, I'm pretty sure. See, you put me on the spot earlier, you know. Now you're going to put me on the spot? Turnabout's fair play. <laughs> yeah, consult. <laughs> So Consult actually, the, the Nimitz Trom, you know, figure yeah. out what Nimitz was. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. regardless of this, whether he's 50 feet, 5 feet, or 25 feet, or 50 miles, he's so pissed off, he leaves his headquarters to go blow off some steam. Mm-hmm. Um, numerous subordinates, and I'm talking like four or five, and the names are in the books, asked Nimitz whether or not he should directly inquire as to the location of Task Force 34, which, of course, is Willis Lee's fast battleships. Initially, what you were saying, John, he did not because he did not want to insert himself in the situation and wanted Halsey to handle his own issues. Yeah. Or as I put it in a note, trash. Hmm. As the situation developed, however, Bill, that changes, doesn't it? It does. By the way, he's still in Pearl Harbor. Okay, he didn't okay. move to Guam until January 45. All Thank right. you. I feel, I feel vindicated. Yeah, Real so time he history. Him, yeah. So he writes down this message. Okay, it's going to say, from Sync Pack, action, Commander Third Fleet, info, Commander Comanche, who's king, Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Fleet. CTF-74, or 77, is also an info address he... And what he writes is, where is, repeat, where is Task Force 34? That's the message. He hands it to his communications mess officer, and one of of many, by the way. There there were many communications officers. This was a guy who would have the watch right now, who who bring trots it down to the message center, and they enter filler in the beginning. And the end of the message, and the reason you do this is you don't want to give intel away by the the enemy being able to read how long the message is, because the length of the message, you can read certain intelligence into it. So you mask the length of the message by adding fodder at the beginning of that, and it's usually meaningless fodder. So in this message, the beginning was turkey trots to water, obviously garbage, right? Nonsense. At the end of the message, the filler was... The world wonders. And the way you can tell the real message from the filler is there, there are two letters in, in code, right? So turkey trots to water, GG, golf, golf. That means after the golf, golf, this is the message. Real and stuff at the end starts of the, here. Pardon? Real stuff Separate. starts here. Yeah. The real stuff starts start here, right? And at the end of the message, it's Romeo, Romeo. They wouldn't have used the phonetic alphabet. It would have been different uh, phonetic bits. R, R. So you, the way the message reads is Turkey trots to water, GG from Sync Pack, Action Com Third Fleet, Info Com Inch, CTF 74, X. That means stop. Where is repeat, RPT? Where is Task Force 34, R, R, the world wonders? And that's the message. So how's that received, Seth? Not well. 
not well because somebody aboard USS New Jersey doesn't Neglects. take out. Yeah, yeah, and this is this is a screw up on that part. And that somebody's gonna who was it? I don't know. It was right. Probably some you know seaman first in the yeah. radio room didn't take that part of the message out. Regardless of that or not, the message that Halsey gets in his hands says, "Where is repeat? Where is Task Force Thirty Four? The world wonders." And when he reads this, Halsey goes, flies in. Yeah, he goes ballistic. Ballistic. Yep. Apparently, not because those people are dying, <laughs> but because someone's <laughs> calling him on the spot. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He he apparently like. And there's multiple different renditions of what happens. Supposedly, he takes his cover off and slams it to the deck and stamps on it. And I, so supposedly, yeah. somebody else says he starts crying. I find that very hard to believe. I, I read that though. Yeah, yeah I, I, yeah. I mean, there's multiple accounts of what happened. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is, is he loses his mind. Halsey loses his mind right here. Starts screaming and hollering, and this is documented on the bridge of the USS New Jersey. His chief of staff, the guy we mentioned last week, Mick Carney, apparently gets Halsey by the shirt sleeve, grabs the fleet admiral. Well, I don't think he's a fleet admiral at this time. Regardless, grabs Halsey by the shirt sleeve, takes him by both arms and says, what the hell are you doing? Get yourself together right now. And then Halsey like, comes to and goes, retreats into his cabin with Carney. And they're in there for an hour. An hour trying mm -hmm. to get himself back together. Nobody knows what went on in there. Nobody knows what was said. But at some point, apparently, he realizes, he being Halsey, realizes that there was a mistake made and he starts to cool himself off a little bit. But it took the man over an hour in the middle of, he's in the middle which, of the Cape. Yeah. Right. It, which yeah. isn't the, helping Ziggy Sprague any. You know? It's not helping no. anybody. Yeah, he anybody. should be solving the problem. Instead, he is he's crying and whining and you know whatever he is doing. Yeah, yeah. So he's in the middle of the Battle of Cape Engano, which we'll talk about next week, and the Battle of Samar is going on at the same damn time. So he's got, admittedly, he's got a lot of things going on, but he retreats to his cabin for an hour in the middle of all this circus yeah. to get himself back together because he loses his composure here. The message. The intent of the message was clear, however, even after you take out the, the world wonders, the, the, the padding. Nimitz realizes that something is, something stinks, something ain't right, something is wrong. And the message was a slap across the face to Bill Halsey, basically saying, get your stuff together and what what is going on here? Yeah, fix it. First of all, tell me what the heck is going on. And second of all, fix it. Fix it. <laughs> fix yeah. it like now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and, and here, and we alluded to this last week, excuse me, and we mentioned it a little bit this week, Halsey's communications, if nothing else, were massively confusing to everyone, to literally everyone, and Kincaid, his subordinates, everybody. Nothing is clear here, and to what you said, John, last week, and again, you piled on to Bill, his staff. This is a staff issue. Even if Bill Halsey says, here, here's my messages, you, that's what your staff is for is to align this kind of stuff, and they fail Bill Halsey here. So according to what Nimitz saw, Halsey's lack of clarity, which is very abundantly clear if you read the messages, to Kincaid is what allowed the situation to exist as it was at that time. Nimitz was more irritated about that than anything. It's not, not that we couldn't handle the situation. is that Halsey's complete lack of discipline lack of uh, organization is what caused the problems that they're experiencing right now. The end result is that Task Force 34 is indeed formed. They reverse course and speed off, but they are never going to catch Corita, even with the if, throttles if on I New could, Jersey wide open. If I could inject here, Seth, real quick, Absolutely. you know, there, we do learn from things like this. And in modern um, orders, the guidelines, there's something that's always promulgated called commander's intent. And so for before a battle like this, the commander would publish his overall intent. And basically, if you ever see anything that doesn't conform to my articulation of my intent here, you need to call call it out, right? You need to call me out, call it, call it out. There was no iteration, there's no time, the slightest vestige of commander's intent 
communicated by Halsey or anyone else at any point throughout this campaign, let alone battle. And so that's a real defect. We do we did try to fix this after this battle, um, and it's part of our doctrine today that you, you before you write any orders, you write commander's intent, and it yeah. largely derived from battles like this one that occurred during World War II. So regardless of all this mess, this battle's still going on, and it is still going on full bore. And as we've said the last two episodes, the air attacks are what is going to make Karita go, eh, is going to give him pause. There is some serious aerial activity going on here. The common idea... Go ahead, John. You're about to say something. No, no, no. I, I yeah, we we've, we've already alluded to this that yeah. you know the combat has been a furball. Um, mm -hmm. The Japanese find themselves in a hornet's nest, and they are under continual air attack during this this time. Not huge formations of aircraft, you know, a half incessant. dozen here, four here. Yeah, but it, it's it's going on all the time, and it's constantly breaking apart their formation. It's making their gunnery crappy, and it's making their overall speed of advance towards these carriers. Yes, they're getting closer to them slowly, but it takes an awful long time to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, when more torpedo armed uh, TBF Avengers show up on, on the scene, they're going to start doing actual more physical damage to these ships as well. All right. So for those of you who are very observant, which is, of course, to say all of you, you probably realize that at least two of the three figures you see on screen have changed their clothes. And it's because what you don't know is I have a DeLorean and a flux capacitor parked outside this museum. No, in all honesty, we had, we had, we had technical issues yesterday. We have to wrap this up today. So, and Seth forgot his shirt in the dryer. So here we are. <laughs> but that being said, back to the show. Back so, to the show. Back to the show. As you know, there's a common idea, there's a common myth, guys, that, that Taffy 3 was essentially helpless. And as we have just been hammering these last two episodes, is that they most certainly were not. Obviously, everybody knows about the destroyer and destroyer escort fight and in, in, in all of its glory, all its rightful glory. But the air attacks on Kurita, as we have hammered throughout these last several hours, are what really forced Kirita to rethink his whole idea. And it all started as soon as Ziggy Sprague realized his plight, realized that he was in a bad way. <laughs> he sends a message out basically asking anyone in the vicinity for any kind of help that they can send. The nearest force to him is Taffy 2, under the command of Rear Admiral Felix Stump, who was once the commanding officer of USS Lexington, CV-16. Stump responded to Sprague saying, quote, don't be alarmed, Ziggy. Remember, we are back of you. Don't get excited, unquote, which is <laughs> rather rash, really, when you consider what Ziggy Sprague was being faced with at Easy that time. Easy for you to say, my man. But yeah. Exactly. You're not, exactly. not being shot at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, in Taffy 3's own aircraft do a lot of damage here. But in reality, it's Taffy 2's aircraft that do the most damage. And they do some serious damage here, John. They they really do some significant damage damage to these Japanese cruisers here. Yeah. And and their their first strike from Taffy 2 consisted of Avengers armed with torpedoes and FM2s to strafe, as we've said before. And they launched no less than five strikes against Kurita all day long, which amounted to them dropping at least 49 torpedoes, which is a ridiculous amount, 59 tons of bombs, and 276 rockets. That is not a paltry sum of munitions that were dropped here. This is significant. No, as we were saying, you know, that there is a lot of ordnance being expended on our part. And it's very much in the vein of, you know, just throw whatever you've got at these guys, you know, the kitchen sink, whatever will work. Um, but the end result is going to be that there's a steady drumbeat of attacks and a steady toll of damage being taken uh, on the, the side of the Japanese that are going to result mostly in the demise of a number of their heavy cruisers that they come into this into this fight with. So, Bill, the first heavy cruiser to take some significant damage is Suzuya. Tell us what uh, what happens here. <clears throat> well, Seth, at 0735, she was attacked by 10 Avengers from Taffy 3. A near miss knocked out one of her shafts, reducing her speed to 20 knots. Attacked again by at least 30 aircraft, she was near missed again amidships. 
The near miss ignited a fire near her forward torpedo mount. The fire eventually turned really bad when her fish cooked off at 1100. This is one of many times this kind of thing happens yeah. during the war. Is that right, John? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, Suzuya's sister, of course, is the the late and lamented Mikuma, which suffered this very same fate at the Battle of Midway. Um, the bottom line is you've got, uh, I believe they carried 24 long lance torpedoes on these cruisers. So you've got 16 that are in the mounts and you've got eight that are sitting in ready uh, reload areas all of which are above the main armored deck of this cruiser. So these are not protected. They did have um, Ducal steel lockers that they would keep the warheads in, uh, which were basically good for splinter protection. This is a one inch you know, steel locker. So this is nothing to write home about. And yeah, if you get a big fire going on on the main deck anywhere near these things, eventually you're going to have to face up to the fact that each one of these fish has a 1,080 pound TNT warhead on it. And yeah, when they go off, it's it's a major kaboom. Not only that, of course, but you've got all this liquid oxygen um, or compressed oxygen, I should say, in the torpedo itself, which is <laughs> going to be a wonderful accelerant for any fire that's happening there. So net result is that, yeah, Suzuya's fish, uh, a number of them cook off and do fatal damage uh, to her. Uh, bottom line is that she's going to end up sinking at about 1322. She lingers through the afternoon, uh, but eventually goes down. And uh, the destroyer Okanami takes off about 400 of her crew of about eh, probably 950 or so. And uh, that's all that's all she wrote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes. remember, these torpedoes are one one torpedo, one kill, but that's when they blow up underneath the ship. Somebody's going to ask that question. But you got, you know, 16 here maybe cooking off, maybe all 24. Yeah, they're they're above the waterline, but this is going to be major conflagration. Yeah, real, real bad. So Chukai is another one of uh, Kurita's, Kurita's cruisers that does not escape aerial attack. Uh, at 0850, she's hit by shell fire, probably from Johnson or Heerman, or, and Heerman, God knows, who knows. But she uh, soon after, she's attacked by Avengers from Kitkin Bay, uh, apparently surprising the ship, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, the Avengers received absolutely no AAA fire from uh, Chokai as they were coming in. So several bombs wind up hitting her, according to reports. Her forward engine room is knocked out. John, what can you tell us about this incident? Well, here? this is a really mysterious uh, one because there are no survivors from Chokai, uh, mm -hmm. not a single one. And uh, actually, my esteemed co-author, Tony Tully, did a very lengthy article on the fate of both Shokai and Shikuma during this battle that came out in Warship International back in the year 2000. He thinks that actually the majority of the gunfire that hit Shokai in the early phases of the battle are from none other than Samuel B. Roberts. Mm. And, oh. and that they are sufficient uh, to cause her to be unnavigable by about 0900. So that's oh. quite a thing when you think about it. You know, a destroyer escort apparently putting enough of a hurting on a heavy cruiser to at least have her go dead in the water for a little while. Um, it seems pretty clear uh, from accounts of the Americans that were in the water uh, after their ships were sunk, they saw a Japanese cruiser get back underway at low speed throughout the afternoon and eventually disappear over the horizon. And that would seem to be Chokai. She probably got one of her engines going again. She's being uh, escorted out of the area uh, by the uh, destroyer Fujinami. And eventually, though, it appears that her engines conked out late in the afternoon. Fujinami scuttles her at around 2140. So we're talking, you know, okay. long day. Mm -hmm takes off what surprise uh, survivors she can, starts making her way out of the area, and she is going to be sunk with all hands the following day. And uh, so all of her crew, along with the survivors from Chokai that she had picked up, uh, all perish. Hmm. Well, wow. that's, a, that's a lot of people going down. That's a lot of people. Locker. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Not to be outdone, Chikuma, Bill, she also falls victim to aircraft, doesn't she? 
Yeah, but this time it's from Taffy too, Seth. Avengers from the Natoma Bay hit the cruiser at 0853 in a classic hammer and anvil attack that put at least one torpedo in her port quarter, knocked, knocking out her steering and destroying her rudder. She took two more fish from Kitkun Bay, which flooded her engine room. It's again attacked by Avengers from Omni Bay. She was dead in the water and helpless when they bored in. So coming in on her port side at 1415 in the afternoon, the Avengers threw three fish into her and watched her capsize within 10 minutes. This is, I hate to say it this way, but this is Indianapolis fast, isn't it? Tom? Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And we actually have a couple of pictures from this attack, including one taken by one of the Avengers that has just gone over the top of Chikuma after having put a, a torpedo into her. And Chikuma is already visibly settling by the stern and listing to port. And yes, the the Japanese accounts indicate that she capsizes and sinks by the stern within 15 minutes of that attack. Um, her fate, too, is equally grim in terms of survivors. Uh, a number of the guys are going to be fished out of the water by the destroyer Nowaki. Nowaki then tries making it out of the area. She actually gets hunted down uh, the following day by a surface action group from the Americans and is sunk near the mouth of the Sibuyan uh, Sea. And all of her crew and the survivors go down with her. There is one survivor from Chikuma uh, who was not picked up by Nowaki. He somehow manages to drift and or swim to the island uh, of Samar and and gets out of the water. He's the only guy uh, who lives from that cruiser. Damn. Yeah. Do we have any idea? I know it's a long shot, but do we have any idea what happened to that dude after he got, got a shot? I, no, I do not know. I don't know. Man, I would I imagine to... he did not endure a good fate at the hands yeah, of the could well be. I was to guess. Yeah. So, but the fact that we even know that he survived says that he might have survived too. Yeah, I mean, maybe, who knows? Yeah, anyway. Awesome. Yeah. So these aren't the only ships that are obviously damaged, but yet they're the ones that are take the most the most damage in in these aerial attacks. Um, many of Kurita's ships are damaged in the attacks throughout the day, and even after Kurita breaks off his attack, attack which we're going to talk yes. about in a minute, uh, they were pursued by the aircraft from Taffy One and Taffy Two mainly. Um, so. I put this in the notes to put it into perspective. The amount of aircraft thrown at Kurita by Taffy 2 and 3 throughout the day was actually greater yes. than the amount of aircraft thrown at Kurita by Task Force 38 the previous day. Again, which goes back Think to the larger that. point that this is a pretty formidable force when, when you get right down to it. The individual components are not very battle resistant, but there's a lot of these components. And, you know, Taffy 2 is, is launching attacks all day long. The other thing I point out here, too, is that Corita came into this operation with 10 heavy cruisers, okay? And in the course of the sinkings at Palawan, what happens in uh, the Cebuian Sea where he loses another one damaged, he's going to come out of this battle with only two operational cruisers. There's another pair of cripples that are going to make it back to Singapore. But what this sort of points out is that we're getting into the phase of the war here where U.S. Navy isn't just beating the Japanese Navy anymore. We are annihilating it. And, you know, just looking at the the, the damage done to Kurita's cruiser force gives you a sense for, you know, what's, what's starting to go down at this point. Yeah. yeah. So, guys, the way this is played out throughout the mythology that's developed over the decades is that this brave contingent of destroyers and destroyer escorts took on the a huge Japanese formidable force, yeah, and and at their own sacrifice turned them away, and it's not true. Inexplicably, inexplicably, Corita, you know, after facing these destroyers, runs away. Yeah, now, the part of that story that's not a myth is the bravery aspect of it. Sure, hundred yeah. percent. but that's not at all the way this went down, is it? Right. Yeah, what, what ends up happening here, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about Kurita because he does make the decision um, around 9 in the morning, 9-11, to call this thing off and to turn his force for home. And what the heck was he thinking about? And it's really kind of difficult to suss out what's going on. 
there are some erroneous reports coming in from some of the um, observers on the Japanese ships, the lookouts, if you will, that they're sighting masts to the north of Kurita. And they get it in their minds that that may be another American carrier task force. And they they are frustrated because they can't seem to come to grips with the American carriers that are in front of them, even though they've they've sunk one and damaged another couple. But what I find so interesting here is that when they first sighted Taffy 3, you know, they describe it as being this heaven sent opportunity. You know, it's, it's a miracle that suddenly we've got this target that we've wanted that we think are fleet carriers in our sights. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the, the coming two hours, two and a half hours, the battle is not going the way they want it to go. And now I think there's a sense on Karita's part that I've stuck my neck out way, way, way too far. And now there's this sort of illusory sense of we're surrounded by enemies. There are American carrier task groups all around us. You know, what are we going to do here? We need to go home. Um. Yeah, I. He's already he's already lost the Masashi. Yes, and if he loses the Amato too, end of story, right? Right. Mm. Yeah. So, and we get we get conflicting accounts on this too. I mean, Ugaki says the enemy task force seemed to have prepared for our attack, and the Leyte Anchorage by tank taking a mobile position disposition. As the enemy situation at Leyte was unknown, our attacks into Leyte would only make us an easy prey for the enemy. Instead, better turn about and attack an enemy task force, i.e. this illusory one that they think is to the north, when it least expected us to come. So, yeah, they come about and they go off looking for this task force to the north, which isn't there, which isn't real. And the result is essentially the end of the battle. It's it's kind of nuts. So I got a couple of, I don't know, I don't want to even say theories, but ideas. You yeah, know, we we talked about when we when we talked about civilian sea, we talked about Kurita himself, about the man himself. And he was he'd had a mixed bag of successes and failures or yep. not necessarily failures, but just things that didn't go his way earlier in the war. And he had shown a proclivity for taking care of his men, which is yeah. an admirable trait. And he also and his junior officers had also expressed significant irritation, shall we say, mm -hmm. at the fact that they were being in their minds, sacrificed for something that was potentially out of reach, whether whether they encountered Taffy 3 or not. I think, personally, after having done a lot of reading on this, like like y'all have too, that I think Kurita realizes, like you were saying, that he is somewhat surrounded by enemy, at least in his mind. And again, the fact that he had been taking so many air attacks just this day alone, more than he had twice as much as he had taken the day before, Right. In his mind would confirm that very thing. It's like, good God, where the hell are all these damn airplanes coming from? Yeah. And he whether he thinks or or not that they're chasing Essex class, which obviously there aren't, they aren't, it's got to be in the back of his mind that well, that's only what six carriers? I know they've got more than that. These other cats gotta be around here somewhere, and these damn airplanes gotta be coming from them. So it's only yeah. a matter of time before. Bill Halsey and all the boys show up on that horizon and my goose is cooked and I'm not going to sacrifice my men for something that I think is unattainable. Get the hell out of here while I can. I, that's what I think he's doing. And yeah. he's exhausted. He hadn't slept in three days, by the way. Yeah. And I, and I think that that is an important factor too. I mean, this guy's had a cruiser sunk out from underneath him. He's ended up in the drink. He's still getting over dengue fever. He has not slept well in the past three days. Um, his chief of staff makes a, a really interesting comment, too, about just how demoralizing constant anti-aircraft attacks are, that there's just nothing less uh, productive, I think he put it, than having to endure anti-aircraft attacks. And again, it's just, yeah, the death of 10,000 cuts kind of thing. The, the damage just keeps piling up, and yet we can't seem to get to grips with this force that's in front of us. I, I do find it baffling, though, that you do have a force in front of you, and yet you decide to drop the one that's yeah. in the hand and go for the the one that is, you think, in the, the bush. Phantom. The phantom. So 
Kiyonagi, uh, Kurita's chief of staff, writes after the war, I think, a, a, just a very lucid uh, assessment of the whole thing. He says, looking back today, when all events have been made clear, we should have continued to Leyte Gulf. And even under the circumstances and with our estimate of the enemy's situation at that time, we should have gone into the Gulf. Even with the possibility of enemy carrier forces near at hand, we should have chosen the single definite objective, stuck to it and pushed on. Leyte Gulf lay close at hand and could not run away. And I think that's right on the money. <laughs> I, I, yep, I, it doesn't move very fast. Yeah. And I know there's got to be transports there. They may be empty transports, but at least it's an opportunity to do damage to this enemy. When I fast forward to April 7th, 1945, when Yamato was going to be sunk with horrific loss of life and accomplishing absolutely nothing. I think if you're Karita, you have to understand that this is the all of these ships are going to be sunk at some point in time in this war. If you have the opportunity here at hand, you are actually at grips with the enemy and have the opportunity to do damage to the enemy. I, you, you have to take it. I, I just think his his decision is nonsensical uh, ex post facto. Even if you end up getting your force annihilated, th this is arguably the only opportunity you're going to have to do damage to the enemy. Yeah, yeah. You know, bottom, we thought so little. Or, you know, I shouldn't say that. MacArthur committed to going back to the Philippines. Um, we've argued in prior episodes about whether or not in a King versus MacArthur episode, whether or not that was the right call yeah. from the standpoint of ending the war quickly. Maybe he thinks, my goodness, is the Philippines just aren't worth it, which is kind of the opinion that I came up. You know, we we all, I think, separately came to ex post facto. I mean, you know, with 2020 hindsight. Yeah. The, you know, more direct route to Japan would have probably saved lives, shortened the war and all that. And, you know, if he's thinking, it's kind of where, where you were going, Seth. If he's thinking that for sooner or later, we're going to have the big, we're going to have to duke it out uh, over the homeland. Do I want to survive that day? You know, or is the Philippines really where we're going to lay it all down? I, I personally you know? think just from having read the things that he had said, the attitude mm -hmm. of his JOs before any of this even goes down, mm -hmm. they were, they had not bought into the plan. Yeah. Right. And this is the first time that I know of, John, you would know better than I, but this is the first time that I know of during the entire Pacific War that an admiral and their and his junior officers in the Imperial Navy are going, you know what, this plan sucks. Yeah. And <laughs> this ain't going to work. I mean, they're yeah. not, you know, and we even said that if, if anything, Curita was a realist. He knew the situation was not good. And yeah. he also knew that the decisive battle had long since sailed off into the sunset. Yes. And I really do think that he felt he's like, God dang it, if I, I don't want to waste these guys' lives if I don't have to. And mm -hmm. when he gets in that situation and he gets in that tangled plate of spaghetti of a you know fur ball. just yeah, fur ball yeah. that he's just like, you know what the hell with this? Because yeah. he's not making any gain. Yeah, to your point exactly. He had sunk one carrier and he damaged obviously a lot of other ships and sunk the destroyers and Samuel B. Roberts and everything else. But that's also not sinking the New Jersey. That's yeah. not putting holes in Enterprise. You yeah. know, that's you know, and I I I just think he's like I <laughs> yeah, but, I'm out. but the but the, the the other part of me is that this is a navy which is so ultra Mahanian in its yeah. outlook. You have enemy warships under your guns right now. <laughs> you know, just just by reflexive animal instinct for the sure. 40 years of naval indoctrination that you've had crammed down your throats, how can you throw away that opportunity? Yeah. I haven't no, had I, a minute. Yeah. I can shoot, I can see them. I can shoot at them, you know. You're I don't shooting know. at them. You're shooting yeah, at them now. Shooting at them, right. Just yeah. keep going. You know? yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And you know that whole and I and I, I, I had it somewhere around here. Mark Still's book on Lady Golf, mm. which is the newest study out on Lady Golf. Mm -hmm. He he hypothesizes that the whole sighting report of masts on the horizon was fabricated. That could well be. And 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 that wasn't that was an out. 
that yeah. was an out for Corita because it was apparently it came from Corita and Corita's chief of staff supposedly as the ones that saw the masts on the horizon. So right, you know, honestly, the height of eye, the radar is is higher than the lookouts, and you're going to see it on radar before you see the masts visually. That's and, and there's so, no record of that, by the way. And there's Bastard. no record of that. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I'm 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 with him. I think it was fabricated post facto. We'll never know. Bottom yeah. line right. is we'll never know. And the, the other the other data right. point I'd throw out is that after the war, uh, Kurita is a very unpopular man yeah. within the that. surviving Japanese naval officer community. They just they just couldn't stand this guy, and a lot of them, frankly, you know, just called him a coward. I mean, you're in the middle of a battle and you ran away from an enemy when they were right in front of you. What are you What are you What are you doing? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and you know. Again, counterfactuals are always dangerous. But if he does continue in the late A Gulf, we talked about, you know, Halsey detaching 34. They're going to run into Task Force 34. Like, there's yeah, no are. doubt. They're going to run into him. And, it's, and, and they're going to be annihilated. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. the, the decision, if Karita makes the decision to keep going, his whole force mm -hmm. is going to be wiped out. No um, you know, he may make it into, he will make it into Leyte Gulf. I mean, that's pretty clear. There's nothing really to stop him. Um, but yeah, there's no going back after that. That's for sure. But his, but his whole route in there is still within range of the aircraft on these CVEs, right? So he's going to be pummeled all the way in. Yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, he, just, but he can do more damage on, on, you know, on the way in as well. I'm going to have to true. plow my way through these taffies, but they only go 18 knots. I can do yeah, that. You're going to outrun way. them before, you, before anything right. else. Eventually, no, I, what's going to happen on the American side is that, you know, their formation is going to fall apart. You're going to you're going to fall back on the last resort that a convoy would do under a uh, submarine attack, which is to scatter the convoy. Just everybody run, you know, because now they can't hunt all of us down. Um, being concentrated in one formation is dangerous at a certain point. But, you know, regardless, yeah, Karina is going to be wiped out if he keeps going. But at least he might have been able to do more damage to us. It, it reminds me, I, the entire time we were talking before we had our technical issues yesterday and again today, it, I keep thinking of Louisiana in the middle of August. Why? Because of the freaking mosquitoes. And I'm being serious, though. If you go outside in the afternoon or the late you evening, get way you, know, late. you get hammered with these. Yeah. You feel like a pin cushion inside of 30 seconds. Yeah, And I can imagine that going on in Kirita's mind. He's and it's constant. He's being yeah. harassed by yes. hundreds of mosquitoes for two days. Yeah. All day. And, and and again, you go outside in the summer in Louisiana and after about two minutes you're like, ah God, it's enough. And and you go inside. Right. And then, you know, so, that's a good really, point. Well, really? Yeah. But Seth, in Florida it's the no CMs and they hurt worse. <laughs> yeah. So would it those be the submarines? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 All right. Enough yeah. with the metaphors. Anyway. anyway. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, so to to wrap this epic battle up, the, the battle is clearly an American victory, if not, as I put in the notes, a Pyrrhic victory. And, and it's true. You know, Karita had turned away, been denied his victory, mainly due to aerial attacks that we've been talking about for two days. Uh, the American losses were heavy, however. Uh, two CVEs are sunk. USS St. Lo was sunk later in the day by one of the first organized kamikaze attacks. And that's another talk for another day. Um, two destroyers at Gambier Bay obviously has also lost two destroyers had been sunk. Uh, one destroyer escort had been sunk. 23 aircraft were lost. Four CVEs had been damaged. One destroyer heavily damaged. Of course, that's Hearman. Two destroyer escorts had been damaged to varying degrees and 913 men had been wounded. Uh, over 1,100 Americans are killed in this battle. However, the vast majority of the guys that are killed in this battle from the American side, obviously a lot of them go down with their ships, but the majority of them are actually lost in the water after their ships are sunk. Right. There's a whole debacle about the about the rescue situation here because what, you know, and again, that's another conversation we could have, but it, there's, there's still a fight going on here. Even after Karita pulls away, there's still combat yeah. operations going on. There's guys in the water, so... Yeah. You know, it, it, it's 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 a pyrrhic victory, but it, it it is a victory. I mean, it's clear cut. You know, we turned Karita around here. Right. So the Japanese also suffer, John. I mean, they, you know, we talked about the three cruisers Do we have. I put in the notes, twenty seven hundred men had been lost in various ways, but it's got to be higher than that. 
I feel like it is higher than that. And I don't have a credible number, to be honest. Mm -hmm. it, it, it could well be, you know, around 4,000. And it depends on, you know, where do you slice the beginning and the end of this particular engagement right. too? Um, you know, do the survivors that are lost on Fujinami and, and uh, Nowaki the following day, do those count as part of this action? You know, I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, as we've already talked about, they take another trio of heavy cruisers off of the roster. The battleships, other than Musashi, you know, make it out of there relatively unscathed. But this force is going to be harassed by air attacks all the way back through Sibuyan Sea um, and and beyond until they actually make their way back uh, to Brunei again to refuel. You know, I mean... Guys, for for all intents and purposes, the Battle of Lady Gulf is over. Yet, there is still another engagement that we do have to talk about. But, and of course, that's the Battle of Cape and Ganyo. That's the that's the the carrier battle that hauls. That's the cheese, as we've been saying. That's the cheese. But, but I mean, they were never a threat to Lady Gulf. And yep. and, and I mean, you know, we'll we'll talk more about that next week, and we'll talk. Bill, we'll let Bill sink his teeth into Bill Halsey again. And uh, <laughs> which I know he's dying to do, but uh, yeah, you know, I don't know. Do you guys have anything else to add to this absolutely epic naval clash before we wrap it up? Finally, no, I think we've uh, I've said my piece. Bill, well, the only thing I would say is this is you know, many people consider this the pinnacle in uh, or I don't know how to do an inflection point. There's several inflection points of the Pacific War. Later Gulf, you know, this the battle off Samar, things like this. I mean, many, many, many books have been written about this. So it's got to be an inflection point, too. And yet, despite all of that ink spilt, so many myths still exist that need to be skewered. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we did that today and the last two days, I guess it should be said. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. For those uh, of my cohorts who can't, you know, keep their wardrobe continuity going, you know, from day to day exactly. broadcast. <laughs> there we go. Oh, well, such as it is. But yep. I think the next time we get together, we might have to see if we can coordinate. coordinate. There you go. I like right. that. I like that idea. Right. Well, but, uh, but Seth, I'm all for subtlety and good taste. Yes. In sartorial. Is that a word? Yes. Um, it is. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to have to make sure we're subtle yes. and wearing yes. something tasteful. I we'll like blend in. We'll blend in. Okay. Absolutely blend in. So very with good. that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast, wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. If you want to see the video version of this and any of our other, other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Got a question or comment, send us an email at unauthorized Pacific Podcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Parrott, and I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching for the last couple of days on Samar. John, thank you as always, my friend, for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Always a great time. Absolutely. And Bill, bring us home. See you again next week. <laughs>